Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning from here in New York. Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you might happen to be uh, in the world. My name is Alex Cooley. I have the privilege of being the current director of the Harriman Institute for the Study of Russia, Eurasia, and Eastern Europe here at Columbia University. It is uh, my great pleasure to welcome you all today to this webinar, which is uh, the fourth annual uh, Allworth Lecture. And the annual Edward Allworth Memorial Lectures were established to honor the memory of Professor Allworth. Um, he was a distinguished pioneer in the field of Central Asian studies, uh, an alumnus of the Russian Institute and longtime faculty member um, at Columbia University. He was the founding director of both the program on Soviet nationalities problems in 1970 and the Center for Central Asian Studies in 1984 and a member of our Harriman Institute faculty um, in a distinguished role for over half a century. A groundbreaking research connector of scholars, Allworth made his first tour of Soviet Central Asian Russia in 1957 as one of the early unsponsored American visitors. Um, as a faculty member of Columbia University's Department of Middle East Languages and Cultures, he headed a series of official exchanges between American and Soviet scholars to the Soviet Union in 83 and 85. So always uh, practicing uh, uh, the, the fine art of connecting people and, and fostering mutual understanding. His many publications include eight books. I won't read all of them, but uh, amongst uh, the most important is the seminal Central Asia, A Century of Russian Rule, 1967, which then spawned off many editions, including the third edition uh, published uh, in 1994 as Central Asia, 130 Years of Russian uh, Rules. Um, so the Central Asian Study Society onward, uh, honored Allworth posthumously in his 2016 Life Service to the Field Award. And then just after that award itself, the Lifetime Achievement Award in Central Asian Studies was renamed uh, in his honor. Uh, I just want to mention a, um, a couple more things. If you would like some information about Professor Allworth, um, Orhan uh, Baba Kurban has published a beautiful memorial website and we'll post a link in the chat. Um, as well as to his obituary that was gener generously published by the Central Asian Survey. Uh, the annual lecture that we host is designed to illuminate emerging topics and new scholarship to continue the spirit and legacy of, fun of fostering broader understanding of dynamics um, currently uh, in the region. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce today's uh, lecturer and distinguished speaker, uh, professor Erica Manat Murat, who is an associate professor at the College of International Security Affairs of the National Defense University. Uh, professor Murat's research focuses on violence, mobilization, and security institutions in Eurasia, but also comparatively in countries like India and Mexico. She is the author of three books, including most recently, The Politics of Police Reform, Society Against the State in Post-Soviet Countries. In addition to her academic work, uh, her articles have appeared in uh, leading uh, policy venues like Foreign Affairs, The Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Eurasianet, and Open Democracy. And I should also mention before joining NDU, um, uh, Dr. Marat was a visiting scholar at the Kenyan Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center, and but also worked as an editor uh, for the Russian Service of the Voice in America. Um, so she also has experience as an observer and journalist of the region. So today's Lecture is entitled China's Military and Security Diplomacy in Central Asia, a very current and hot topic. Uh, Erica, we are so grateful that uh, you are this year's uh, lecturer and I will hand over the floor to you. Just the ground rules for today, um, we'll, uh, the lecture will last about 30 minutes uh, with accompanying slides. Then I will ask a couple of follow-up questions. If you would like to ask a question, we will have time for Q&A, please use, um, the Q&A feature in the Zoom, in the webinar. If you are on YouTube, you can um, type your question and then it will be relayed to us and we'll try and get to as many questions as we can. We might bundle uh, a few of them. So again, Erica, uh, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alex, for inviting me. And I am incredibly delighted to be um, part of this lecture series, um, especially that it's, it is in memory of Allworth. Um, and thank you for providing me with this platform to uh, share my research um, 
um, internationally uh, now that we are in an online space. So the title of my presentation today is China's Military and Security Diplomacy in Central Asia. And I'm looking at it from uh, the Central Asian perspective, not from what China's uh, long-term policy is or um, uh, foreign policy is, but really what are the uh, developments in Central Asia. And um, when we talk about Chinese expansion in Central Asia, uh, just like in the rest of the world, we usually refer to the construction of physical infrastructure, such as bridges, roads, railroads. Um, and uh, in the global perspective, it's ports, stadiums, and so on. Um, and this picture usually used to illustrate the real influence of China in Central Asia. This is the dry port Horgos in, um, in Kazakhstan. Uh, what is less discussed on a global scale is not so much the provision of public goods that the China is engaged in, but the public services. Uh, and on a global scale, it is really the Beidou navigation system that rivals the GPS geocentric system, the cross-border interbank, interbank payment system that um, competes with SWIFT code um, and then 5G technologies. And the nature of public services as opposed to public goods is that they're inherently asymmetric. So roughly speaking, if countries, all the countries need um, to construct a bridge or railroad is equity um, in construction materials, when we, when we talk about public services, it's really knowledge and skills inten intensive. There has to be an innovative edge to the provider of public services. Um, they're backed by some tech infrastructure, but unlike roads and bridges and railroads, it's really easy for the provider of public services to increase or decrease the supply of services and sometimes even interrupt should there be a need. So China, again, China can't take back a road, but there is a possibility to, um, you know, there is a possibility to uh, decrease the cutoff, to cut off a uh, provision of public services. And unlike uh, public goods that are at least rhetorically um, aimed at expanding mutual wealth uh, by increasing connect connectivity, public services uh, provided by China, they aim directly government and governance. So they service the functions of government and governance. And the questions that I want to discuss today here is how are Chinese knowledge-based services expanding in Central Asia? So the broader overview, what are they in Central Asia? And then also, of course, what are the, what are the implications of those? And in Central Asia, the public services really mostly focus on military and secu security services. And they began um, earlier, um, you know, the dynamics uh, took place earlier than compared to um, China's involvement in other parts of the world and let's say Africa, Latin America was the creation of SCO and the first drills that were um, um, uh, organized by SCO basically dating back to 2005. And then uh, more recently, uh, starting from about 2014, 2015, we really see a proliferation of other services. And they're well documented in analytical pieces out there. So the private security companies that are um, stationed uh, to protect Chinese businesses. Uh, Niva Yao has been an incredible source of knowledge of the Chinese services and expansion in Central Asia. Um, there, is a, there is an article by her and Dirk uh, uh, Van Der Clay um, in uh, the OXA Society, on the OXA Society website. Then there are, of course, the bilateral military drills. Um, I put equipment there as well because that's an important component of services as well. But the bilateral military drills with China outside of the SCO uh, uh, domain. And then there are consultations, regular consultations between Chinese counterparts counterparts and um, security consoles in Central Asia, also a more recent development. Um, and finally, um, there are police trainings uh, and militarized police trainings between the uh, People's Armed Police uh, in China and then interior ministries in Central Asia. The through line across all those services is, of course, they all counter terrorism, separatism, extremism, this China's view of uh, security uh, that then also um, adapted slightly to the realities of Central Asia and sometimes other security priorities in Central Asia are included, um, such as organized crime or political stability and so on. 
Um, here is a very useful graph by Bradley Jardine and Edwin Lemon on the Kennan uh, Institute website about the dynamics of military exercises in Central Asia among different external actors, so China, SCO, Russia, CIS, STO. And the red um, bars here, they show the expansion of bilateral, um, bilateral trainings between China and Central Asian countries outside of the SCO domain. Um, and the trend is increasing over time. And although now the kind of the blue parts, um, Russia still is uh, presents majority of military drills. Uh, Chinese uh, led drills are now also expanding and uh, reaching almost half of what is offered in Central Asia. So all these um, security services are documented pretty well, and I, I will not rehash them again here. You can find there in open sources, you can find um, great analysis on the SEO drills, on police trainings, on bilateral military drills, and so on. What I do want to focus here is what I've, that I've researched myself, um, and specifically uh, the provision, the Ch Chinese provision of smart technologies in urban areas for uh, public um, security uh, purposes and also senior military education offered by Chinese universities to Central Asian uh, counterparts, uh, to Central Asian military officers. Um, both are new, both have been, ex both have been expanding uh, rapidly in Central Asia. And one, uh, the smart tech in urban areas uh, really has immediate implications in how um, uh, residents of urban areas really uh, relate to public spaces, what their understanding of security or public, public safety um, is uh, because of this expansion of uh, surveillance technologies. So that's, there is an, an immediate short-term impact and the senior military education is more of a long-term investment by China um, that uh, is not uh, necessarily evident today, but may become more obvious uh, going forward. So first, um, here's a map that needs to be really needs to be updated every six months. Um, this this map was published in the Europe Asia Studies uh, Journal, um, and uh, it, it represents the the situation uh, dating back to um, the fall of last year. But there have been new projects and new projects on uh, public surveillance, public sa safety, and security. Um, uh, safety projects that are uh, sponsored by uh, Chinese firms, but also a flurry of other firms, but the Chinese firms really dominate this, uh, this domain. Um, if you can see my mouse, if you can follow my mouse, these, this is Huawei projects and Huawei is present nearly in every country. Um, whenever they are not present, it's a, di present, it's a different um, Chinese company that provides um, technologies for smart city, but actually, you know, the the definition of smart city and safe city, they're used interchangeably. And in the Eurasian context, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a problematic area where uh, smart cities are, um, uh, smart city technologies are branded um, as, so sorry, safe city technologies are branded as smart city technologies. Um, and of course, there is the availability of both innovation and um, investment by Huawei, Hikvision, and a number of other uh, smaller companies. So there are external opportunities, um, and um, it's a it's it's a common um, the common route to expanding those technologies is usually uh, presidents, um, ministers. Uh, mayors, um, entrepreneurs uh, invited to China and then impressed by uh, the cutting edge technologies uh, at Huawei headquarters or Huawei Vision headquarters and then offered an opportunity to install similar technologies back at home and um, in their and urban areas at home. Um, there is a certain global prestige that is associated now with innovating urban space and a large wealthy cities like Nur Sultan, um, Almaty, and um, I think uh, Tashkent now, they're, they're, they're living up to this um, idea of, um, um, you know, of, of becoming um, a, a, an innovative space, a city, a smart city, a really the, a modern city. So there is that drive as well. Uh, but the, uh, it's not just the foreign policy or foreign resources that are available. The really the drive, the drive for uh, technological innovation in public spaces is really local. There is a domestic demand in cities, and uh, I um, I started researching this domain, the expansion of surveillance technologies in urban areas, uh, from uh, noticing what kind of police reform programs that is. Um, 
that are expected uh, by uh, domestic public, um, by uh, mostly long-term middle class in urban areas um, in uh, Eurasia, but also in Central Asia specifically. So urban areas in Central Asia, just like um, you know, most of Global South, they, they have been uh, increasingly more diversified with um, new migrants, internal migrants uh, coming into urban space. And there is a demand by the urban middle class or what's called um, authoritarian middle class um, to create a public order and to um, uh, impart a certain le level of um, urbanity to newcomers, quote unquote, newcomers, backward newcomers. And uh, part of that discourse is also expanding the surveillance um, infrastructure within a city in public spaces, especially in spaces where long-term and short-term um, urban uh, dwellers interact, be that uh, shopping areas, public, uh, public squares, um, so that disorderly and uh, criminal behavior is better detected and then also punished. So there is the domestic domestic demand for that and surveillance technologies that provide us quick fixes for um, municipal and national um, leaders um, to at least create a vision and sense of um, public safety. Uh, but of course, they, there is no really discussion of who is watching whom and whether um, the discussions that we are uh, accustomed to here in the West of uh, that Huawei has this backdoor um, entry, you know, whenever it expands its technologies in uh, whatever context that there isn't necessarily the uh, national interest present in there as well. So the, the, these kind of discussions, they don't take place in Central Asia. Um, they are and actually in all, all, of, all of Eurasia. And uh, there is really no understanding of what can, how data um, is used and for what purposes by uh, what, uh, what actors. Um, so the, law, the more long-term uh, service that has uh, been uh, recently introduced in Central Asia, um, and, and Central Asia, so this is not, it's, it's not just unique to Central Asia, it is unique to, uh, it, is, uh, it is a case for the rest of the world when China switched, um, you know, so when China became more for, um, external about its, uh, about how PLA engages, so People's Liberation Army engages in the international, um, international, um, with international partners. So in Central Asia is just part of that bigger, um, uh, dynamics in the world. But what we see um, in Central Asia is that the traditionally occupied um, space of mil professional military education, as we know it here in, in, in the West, the professional military education is uh, now being also um, diversified with uh, offerings from China. And it's not, so the Chinese supply is one uh, aspect of this, um, of this dynamics, but there is also what's happening on the regional level and on the local level that is important to understand. So on the regional level, China, re um, Russia recently switched its uh, military education into roughly three tier uh, approach that the first tier is for Russian citizens who have the uh, best ac access to uh, sensitive and classified information. That's normal, that happens in most uh, academies, uh, military academies in the world that um, in, uh, invite international students. But then uh, the next two tiers are really key. The second tier is for uh, CSTO member states um, who, are, who participate uh, in more um, activities and share more materials between each other about joint, joint planning, joint understanding of regional security. And then the third tier is non-CSTO uh, countries, uh, which are in Central Asia, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. So they are left now with countries um, from, uh, so they, they receive the same level of access to Russian education um, as let's say students from Africa or, or South Asia. And the trend um, for, for, for a while, um, both Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan sent their officers, especially for higher education, uh, for the more uh, graduate level education to Belarus and Ukraine, where there was also Russian language education, but it was still a more um, diversified, more, more um, expansive discussion of security. Uh, but now China became a supplier of education as well. And now those countries have the opportunity to send uh, more students to, uh, to China. Uh, Chinese supply of uh, slots 
for Central Asian countries is still uh, still outstrips the demand. So there is still more of a supply than there is a demand. And the Russian education is still the more prestigious one. But this dynamics may change uh, going forward because um, of, of the changes that are taking place with the modernization of PLA and uh, edu military education in general in, uh, in China compared to Russia. Um, so what Central Asian students, just like students from 160 other countries, um, that are in, currently invited to um, uh, to military academies in China, they have access to understanding the recent um, push for modernization of PLA, the uh, the use of AI technologies, um, and uh, by the uh, by the Chinese military um, and police, um, and um, that this education is closely tied with China's also cultural studies. Um, so the the it's a uh, some, some of the pedagogical uh, approaches to global security are similar to that of Russian, but then there is also this uh, another layer of the Chinese cultural studies, um, the Confucius, um, Confucius studies or the studies of free warfare that are new to Central Asian, um, to Central Asian officers. And uh, the so I'm from the National Defense University here in Washington, D.C., uh, but there is also a, a National Defense University in Beijing, uh, that's PLA National Defense University, that in, also invites international students um, to, um, to receive uh, military education. And it's really um, the education aspect is really different from trainings. So CS, CS, uh, CSO, so SCO um, in China uh, may be uh, conducting bilateral trainings or multilateral trainings. And then also, of course, uh, Western agencies or countries, um, so United States and NATO countries um, also conduct trainings with Central Asian uh, officers. Um, and you know there are, there are hundreds and maybe even thousands of officers who have been trained by uh, CENTCOM or IMET um, as part of counterterrorism programs or um, special forces operations. Uh, but uh, it's really different. So trainings are really different from education. Education is where you uh, is where students are um, spend more time in a foreign institution and then are um, socialized into understanding of security and uh, appropriate responses to security problems from the perspective of, of the host country. And uh, Russia for a long time has been focusing on the, uh, on the experience of the Second World War and now is switching towards understanding of hybrid warfare. I think Chinese understanding of hybrid warfare, uh, again, based on its three warfares, um, you know, the tradition of three warfares, the public opinion warfare, the psychological and the legal warfare, um, it's really, um, it, it, it presents a slightly different angle for Central Asian countries and maybe even slightly more um, useful angle for Central Asian countries. Plus also um, the stipends are higher for, um, for students going to uh, PLA and DU um, as opposed to let's say military academy of the general staff of the armed forces in Russia. Um, and it's, um, and it's a long-term, it's a long-term investment in creating this jointness. Um, of operations and understanding of what uh, global security is. And the difference of Central Asia from many other countries in the world, uh, and including in the form of Soviet space, is that there are really just the Russian and Chinese um, offerings uh, for um, military education. Uh, very few Central Asian um, senior leaders, um, senior officers are invited to Western academies for education, again, not just training, but for education. And that's, of course, in contrast to um, countries like Georgia, Azerbaijan, um, Armenia, Ukraine, Ukrainian um, defense minister currently is, um, he is the graduate of uh, NDU here in Washington, DC. And nearly every <laughs> leader, every uh, high ranking uh, defense and security official in Georgia has a Western degree. So it's a really, it's a re really different dynamics and it's, a, it's more of a competition. So the Chinese offerings of competition really off, um, really compete with that of um, Russian, Russian offerings. And it goes into, so the offerings and the military education, it goes um, um, together with the, with the expansion of trainings. So what are the implications? Um, so the uh, Marlene Laruel and myself, uh, we are currently in, uh, conducting a huge project on uh, China and Russia service provision in the, in the world. And Central Asia is part of, of course, our studies. And then, um, we extracted cooperation events from the global database of events 
um, um, language and tone. And we, what we note is that at least as reported by media, at least as reported by media, there are more cooperation events, and that includes everything, the economic and military, diplomatic. There are more cooperation events with Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and China, um, as opposed to with Russia. So the Kazakhstan is the only exception where there is more cooperation events, again, as reported by media. But not only that, but um, those cooperation events are presented in a more positive light. So if you can look at, um, if you can uh, track my um, explanation here. So here is an example of China, Tajikistan events in general, everything, including everything, cooperation or non-cooperation, you know, um, cultural exchanges. Um, the gray uh, curveball is the uh, presentation of uh, cooperation in Tajikistan by the Chinese media, and it's uh, it's uh, the this graph demonstrates the tonality of um, uh, reporting, and uh, right from this uh, everything right from this uh, from the this line is more positive. Um, so the Chinese are presentation of its own. Uh, relations with Tajikistan is more positive. But what's interesting is that Tajikistan's representation of uh, relations with China is also veering more towards positive. Whereas our understanding, and if you can see uh, those two curves, the yellow curve that is hiding behind the um, behind the blue curve, the yellow curve is international media, and that's mostly dominated by you know, Western media, and it's mostly negative. So our understanding, um, our understanding of how Chinese Tajikistan relations are. Uh, developing is not only different from how China is reporting it, but also how domestic media presents it. And that's a consistent picture that we see across Central Asian countries. This is just one example. Um, and across the world that the Chinese uh, media messaging is extremely, um, extremely uh, um, disciplined and pragmatically positive um, and it's towards the right. Um, here's an example of a uh, con contrasting example of uh, Russian Tajikistan relations. Uh, and again, uh, the, the gray curve area is the uh, China's coverage of Russia. It's neutral, uh, followed by neutral and slightly more negative by, um, by Tajikistan. And Russia, what's interesting, um, is always, and it's not only Central Asia, it's the same with Turkey, it's the same with Pakistan, the same with Egypt. Russian coverage of its relations with countries tends to focus on more negative aspects. And it's a more scattered, it's not as the sharp curve uh, that we see with Chinese media. Here's an example with Kazakhstan, uh, which, which is, I, I find fascinating how Chinese media, and again, extremely controlled message, very often has to do with uh, repeating the same, the same aspects of cooperation when it comes to security cooperation, uh, again, terrorism, separatism, extremism. And it's really closely aligned with what Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan reports about its relations with, um, with, with China. This is specifically for cooperation and it tends to be even more positive than uh, just the general Chinese-Kazakhstan relations. So it is presented um, domestically, it is presented from a, a mostly positive light uh, by the domestic, domestic media. Our understanding tends to be more negative. Um, here's another example that's from Uzbekistan, and we see how the Chinese involvement in Uzbekistan, this is presentation, so the, the first uh, bar here represents the Chinese coverage, the volume, the frequency of Chinese coverage of um, events uh, with Uzbekistan, and it's really 10 times more frequent than uh, what uh, Uzbekistan media reports. Uh, but the tonality really matches the tonality that um, Chinese media, both Chinese media, so this, this, the upper row, and uh, the third row, the Uzbek media, they tend to be mostly positive about their engagement. And the implications here, if we want to connect, sort of, if, um, I'm connect here to connect the dots. Um, so GDELT is not really good in extracting military cooperation on that. So it, we matched our um, qualitative find findings for more well, quant quantitative findings. But there is really a uh, controlled message about uh, China's involvement in Central Asia and it's pragmatically positive, it's really disciplined. And it's also, if, if we're here to talk uh, about Russia, um, Russia has a more scattered messaging and it sort of uh, undermines our I, I understanding of this uh, top-down Kremlin-based messaging of uh, its involvement in the world. What's, I think what's important here is that it dampens the impact of negative events um, and the coverage of negative events. And the negative events don't, uh, based on the findings from uh, the large data set, they don't get as much coverage. 
um, perhaps, perhaps one of the uh, reasons is of the really controlled messaging also by the Chinese media. Um, and then um, the, uh, the more qualitative finding here is that the, the Ch when China is really um, substituting the area where Russia has uh, traditional presence, it's really um, does that through slightly changed uh, security perspectives uh, on, on the regional security and the from Chinese centric uh, security perspectives. And it's not so much about uh, questioning or um, elaborating more uh, new approaches to security, but it is uh, about uh, expanding the uh, Chinese centric security perspectives to Central, uh, to Central Asia as well. There are new uh, domain, security domains that are created. Um, that's um, the, the way urban spaces are policed now um, and uh, just the proliferation of uh, the facial recognition uh, technologies um, across, um, across Central Asian uh, countries now um, that we see. Um, so um, I'm running out of my time, but uh, here uh, the conclusion. So it's very much, um, very much, uh, so this research was in, in part also inspired by uh, um, research and about findings uh, by Alex Cooley, of course, on the right, and by Marlene Arwell by the, on the rise of the liberal values. Um, and the, 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 just the overall um, conclusion of these, um, of, of my presentation is that there are, of course, this regional, uh, regional demand and national demand for, um, for the for the services provided by Russia and China. So it's traditionally been Ch Russian um, um, influence, but now Chinese kind of presenting the substitute. And it's it's uh, the services are uh, strengthening the power vertical. The way countries are able to respond to um, social problems in the, on the street of uh, on the streets of um, capital cities or um, how um, you know, police forces are able to be, uh, to rapidly respond to let's say protests or um, um, yeah, to uh, inst inst instability. Um, it is it is a subst substitute to uh, traditional Russian services. It does uh, the the um, services like uh, surveillance technologies in urban cities. They do override and undermine the efforts of the Western uh, programs from the 1990s, 2000s, and um, police reform programs that aimed at uh, democratizing. Uh, police forces, making them less militarized, more open to external oversight. So that completely overrides so the external, um, the, the influence uh, from the uh, Chinese services, they override these um, principles of, um, of governance that were um, the goal of Chinese programs, oh, sorry, Western programs. And West pro programs, they still exist in the Central Asian context, but really they are completely overshadowed now. Uh, by uh, the proliferation of Chinese services. Um, and then also, I think, um, uh, you know, the, the provision of public goods uh, may have an end to it, a certain end when the number of um, investments and loans uh, decreases over time. But the nature of public services is so that it takes more time to socialize and to, uh, and to create um, connections between um, Chinese service uh, security apparatus and Central Asian security apparatus. But what we know uh, from the Russian example, from Russian, the Soviet and Russian example, even when the money dries up, the, there, is the, there continues to be inertia of a common understanding and um, uh, sort of common nor normative understanding of what, um, what regional and national security challenges are. And I think uh, this foundation for more long-term uh, common, common understanding uh, has been um, first uh, created by the SCO, of course, but is now really expanding into uh, other agencies, so police agencies and um, um, local surveillance agencies uh, in the last few years as well. I'm open to questions now. Terrific, thanks so much. So um, you covered <coughs> some really interesting contemporary ground, just some remarkable data that you have there, as well as very big picture implications, you know, multiple ones. Uh, let me kick off with a couple of questions. One is absolutely fascinating on your graphs of media coverage and how they overlap and how in general host media coverage tends to be 
almost or overlappingly positive with Chinese media coverage. Um, and I'm wondering whether uh, this has moved the needle at all in terms of broader public attitudes, which in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, at least from the survey data I've seen, um, not so much in Uzbekistan, but Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, the public sentiment towards China is pretty overwhelmingly negative. Not as well negative as the US, but still you have that disconnect between elite and sort of state sponsored institutions and then kind of public opinion. So uh, I'm wondering how, you know, A, whether you agree with that, whether that's a dated view or whether you've both seen evidence of the media campaign moving public opinion, if not generally, then on specific issues. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. I mean, there's so much anxiety about the uh, ballooning debt to China, uh, possible land grabs from China. Um, and of course, the, um, the concentration camps in China is also something that is discussed in the society. And there is a level of frustration about uh, um, Central Asian governments not saying anything about those camps. So this anxiety absolutely exists. And um, in Kyrgyzstan, there, and I think also now more frequently now in Kazakhstan, there is, um, um, uh, there were, you know, there were recurring protests against uh, Chinese expansion um, or Chinese influence uh, in uh, in the economic domain. However, the point here was the media is that the local domestic media does not cover that. Domestic media does not reflect. It's also almost like the, those two domains: one that is the word of mouth, maybe uh, in social media that takes place, and another is in uh, in media outlets. And the media outlets they reflect the Chinese perspective. Uh, if we are to make this uh, speculation of why is there such an um, overlap between the tonality of Chinese coverage and uh, domestic media coverage, that there is uh, they use the same language in covering the relations with, with China. Um, in the long term, will they, how long will this be, will this you know, influence on uh, containing public frustration uh, will uh, last? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's different, you know, it's a different question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I have answers for that, but for now, uh, and for the past five years, this has been the picture. And we chose the 2015 to 2020 period, uh, so kind of to and uh, before the coronavirus <laughs> uh, started um, spreading in, in the region to kind of to eliminate that other uh, factor. But yeah, there are two different domains. There is the dominant media domain that presents um, the Chinese perspective, really. But, and what I also want to match, this is, uh, there is a mismatch between what the media tells about, so this is a kind of other part of our research, what the domestic media reports about what Russian media reports. There is a mismatch there. So in that sense, we kind of show that um, Chinese media is a little, uh, is more influential at this point on um, how it's presented, how its influence in Central Asia is presented than even a Russian uh, own presentation of itself. Great, thank you. So let's move on to some of the audience questions. If you have a question, I would ask that you use the Q&A function as opposed to paste them in the chat. Um, it's easier for us to keep track of them as they're going on. We'll, we'll, we'll try and extract those ones from the chat, but please try and use the Q&A function. Uh, first, I wanna bundle a couple of questions. One is from Julia, uh, uh, Julia. the other one is from uh, Karazina uh, on the question of media. Uh, Julia asked whether you could give us some additional details on the media that you chose uh, yeah. to analyze. Well, you know, what is this representative of? Uh, and then um, uh, Karadzina asked, was there any comparative analysis on bilingual Central, A on, uh, Central Asian media? Uh, I, have once, I once came across a paper on Kyrgyz media, but turned out it was only on publications in Russian, but not in Kyrgyz. So how did you handle, I think, the local language versus sort of the Russian language type of issue? Right. Um, so what uh, GDEL really does is it translate or automatically translates uh, many different languages um, uh, and then co codes uh, words along its tonality. So negative would be peace, dis um, war, disagreement, conflict, um, where protest, whereas the positive would be agreement, friendship, collaboration, and so on. Um, and it does, so it does cover local media in uh, local languages, both, uh, let's say, if, if it's the case of Uzbekistan, both uh, media in Uzbek language and in Russian language, um, and it then automatically translates. So that bias is, um, 
um, in a, you know, is, is addressed. Uh, when it comes to, let's say, international media, that one of our findings was that um, when we, uh, so there is, you know, thousands and thousands of international media outlets, anything from, I don't know, uh, Jamaica Daily to Malta Herald and so on, uh, along with CNN or New York Times and all that. So when we, uh, we, when we uh, separated all the, all the what we call noise, right, the not really influential global media outlets and took just the global media outlets from different countries, um, there was a huge overlap. And usually that media was uh, more of a Western based. So there was still the Western dominance and then global media coverage. So be that CNN or um, New York Times. So there is an overlap. The international media in general um, on developments in Central Asia it kind of, it replicates what the Wall Street Journal or New York Times publishes or AP or Reuters, Reuters publish. Um, so the independent, if we take the major outlets or this whole variety of outlets internationally, and when we see them mostly covering events negatively associated with China specifically, they really, it's the picture that we're presented with is different from uh, domestic and Chinese media. That's super interesting. Uh, and then I think one more, just on media follow-up, kind of a methods question from Jonathan here. Have you weighted different media sources based on the influence and reach of specific media outlets? Does every media mention count equally? That's something that you were getting at in your right. comments slide. Yeah, so um, so that's what we, we, we try to dissect that with the international media, just because of the sheer number of uh, international media. Uh, when it comes to uh, domestic media and uh, Chinese media, we absolutely did. We took uh, just the ones that have um, uh, the largest numbers of, of stories, and it's really it's not that many for uh, for China even. It's Xinhua. Um, uh, net and then a, a few others uh, that produce the most number of stories, the most number of stories. Um, and then also domestic media, it's, it, those are not large um, data sets. Uh, it's mostly you know, anything from uh, seven to 10 outlets that, are, that we produce the most number of stories as well when it comes to domestic media. Super. Um, okay, let's move into some uh, different uh, topics here. Uh, one from uh, Frank, he asks, how much of the expansion of private firms offering services in Central Asia is state-driven? How much of it is a private company-led for-profit effort? For example, uh, he cites sort of Huawei. Is this Huawei's business plan in Central Asia, or is it consistent with Chinese regional security policy? Um, so let's, let's take that part, because I think that's the most interesting uh, in terms of the private security angle on this, you know, and sometimes it sort of reminds me a little bit what there's analogy with like the war on terror, right? Post 9-11, every firm out there that was getting a homeland security contract was saying, we're fighting the war on terror. We're an essential part of it. And yet, you know, they were just being driven by their own kind of interest and profit, right? Invoking that as their justification. So I'm wondering, you know, how you feel about that in uh, the, the, the private firm in this kind of very interesting domain of service provision that you're looking at. Right. So when it comes to smart cameras, you know, so when we talk about, so when we talk about uh, smart CD developments uh, in Eurasia, mostly, but specifically in Central Asia, it really, we are talking about surveillance cameras, facial recognition and so cameras and um, um, license plates recognition cameras that kind of detect disorderly behavior. Um, and they're provided by Huawei and Hikvision mostly and a number of smaller companies by China. So Huawei is the largest provider. And of course, we know that the, the founder of Huawei um, is a former PLA officer. Um, there is really, um, so if I have to speak about the Chinese foreign policy through economic uh, expansion or security expansion, there is really a tight connection between um, uh, technological innovations and security apparatus. And that innovation, this kind of the merger have, took place uh, recently and under, um, under the current leadership in China. Uh, and it kind of dates back a little bit before Xi, Xi but it's, uh, it really took off now that the PLA as a part of its modernization really uh, became closer, um, closer tight was the te technological uh, tech sector in, in China. And the assumption is um, pretty much, you know, derived from Western research, of course, is that 
it's part it's part of the foreign policy. It's part of engagement and in countries. And um, you know, there are lots of speculations about what Huawei does. Uh, and one of the more recurring ones is that this global competition for um, AI innovations, um, data, uh, organizations and governments really have to harvest data from around the world. So to sit on as much data as possible to then develop AI. Um, uh, capabilities and we have to speculate that. So this is one of the areas where we can say that uh, Huawei now in Eurasia, but also around the world really has, uh, is collecting a huge num amount of data on just human behavior. Um, and um, the public, there is no public discussion how this data is used. Um, there is more discussion about Russian companies, um, for instance, Vega, that is part of Rostec, that is uh, currently in Bishkek. And there we found out that the cloud for the data collected in Bishkek is located in, uh, in Russia. So, you know, if we have to speculate about this, of course, of course, there is an eye. Um, so there is an eye that is, uh, um, there is a, both in Huawei headquarters, but also uh, in, on the government level in China about the developments uh, on the streets of uh, any, any given city in, in Eurasia. It's um, very interesting. And then I, just as a related follow-up from uh, Yanis Tiligakis who asks, is China developing its own contractor consultant class or do they hire and employ American and European contractors? I think this is also interesting in the context of uh, private security firm support and analysis. There is this kind of uh, in between kind of service provision of kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, providing political risk analysis for Chinese firms who are operating in the region. And that's sort of an interesting space, whether you would solely rely on sort of Chinese contractors or bring in locals or even Western analysts. Um, any insights there? So on military contractors uh, or security contracts with us, so I want to be cl uh, clear here, it's not really, we're not really talking about military contractors in uh, the Central Asian context, it's uh, the security contracts. When we talk about military contractors, uh, well, I think we very often refer to Russia and the Wagner Group, which is also a thing of service provision uh, for illiberal governance out there. Um, but for security contractors, there is a flurry of companies that are present in Central Asia. Again, I, um, I advise you, so the, all the knowledge I have is from the Oxus Society's uh, research into uh, private security companies in Central Asia. It's on their website. Um, and you can look, there's a kind of a table with all the contractors um, there. And again, this is a new development in Central, and it, it's it's well, one of the things that's important to remember is that it, it is paired to uh, the, uh, the provision of public goods as well. It is paired with the expansion of economic influence, so the security aspects are. Um, I, I think, um, <laughs> so I think uh, when BRI was first announced, uh, the discussions in Washington DC were all, all, almost like, oh, will that be political? Will that be, become political? Will that become security? Um, interest of, of China. And it, yes, it is happening right now. It is political and it is uh, in the, so mi military education, for instance, exchanges in military education is very political. It's a political project. Uh, it's, there's nothing, there's, uh, there's the economic interest, but it's a political pro project. So, um, so again, another takeaway is that it is happening. So the future is now, there is a political influence. There is the um, security interest in China that we see in Central Asia. That's great. And that segues into our next question from uh, Nuruddin, uh, who asks uh, the, the, the question about uh, Russian versus Chinese cooperation, cooperation in the field of military education. He asked, don't you think that Russian Federation keeps Central Asian countries as close to itself as possible? Not letting go. They summon Ukraine and Georgia. Um, and you mentioned, in fact, the contrast between Georgia and some of these other countries in your presentation. And then he asked specifically, do you think that an attempt to establish military cooperation between Central Asian studies and the West uh, will aggravate relations with the Russian Federation? Um, and he sort of cites the question of, uh, of a case of Uzbekistan this week. And in general, how do you view this area of military education now? Is it clearly competitive? Um, is it equally competitive amongst the three or have the Russians just sort of ceded this to the Chinese um, kind of after the fact and just said, well, you know, we have this pragmatic cooperation. We're not going to sort of talk about this in public as being an issue because we don't want to draw attention to it. 
Yeah. Um, so it's definitely not a competition between three. It's really it's a it's a it's a domain that is divided between Russia and China. There is such a little involvement of um, um, of Central Asian officers, especially um, mid level and senior senior officers in education programs and. Uh, in NATO countries, including United States, there's almost there's you know it's it's hard to compare with um, I mean countries like Ukraine or Georgia or Azerbaijan. So, but uh, again, I want to reiterate, Russian still Russian education really still dominates, and it, it, it is the golden standard for Central Asian officers. But the speed with which Chinese offerings are expanding is also interesting, <laughs> and the opportunities that they provide to um, to um, officers in Central Asia, and specifically to Uzbekistani and uh, Turkmenistani officers, is, is 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 impressive. The supply now outstrips the demand, so uh, it may take um, it, it may take more time for the demand to catch up. Get, you know, with more graduates coming back. Uh, from uh, China and sharing their experience, um, or uh, Central Asian governments can try to continue to balance between uh, Russian education and Chinese education. I think the demand um, now, uh, the, so the supply now outstrips the demand is just, it's because of that. It's because uh, there, is, uh, there is the prestige, but also an effort to balance, not to kind of completely um, change direction and go to uh, the, you know, go with the Chinese partners because it, it, it is a new development. But um, again, if I, if I have to speculate uh, in the long term, it, may be, it may, might become more normal that officers receive um, professional, professional military education degrees uh, in Chinese universities as well, because the, the infrastructure is there, the opportunities are there. I can talk more about the kind of education, the curriculum that uh, China offers and how it's similar and different from, from Russian. That's, that's also a fascinating topic. Um, there is, of course, the indoctrination of uh, that China. There's nothing to see in Urumqi <laughs> sort of uh, picture uh, that, um, and uh, this I know from graduates, uh, from Central Asian graduates um, of uh, NGU PLA. Um, and, uh, but another issue for Russian military academies is that um, new cadets, so younger generations of cadets, they don't speak Russian language. So it's, it's a limiting factor. Uh, for Russia. It's the same limiting factor for China, of course. Uh, China, when China invites uh, Central Asian or international officers, they don't uh, offer uh, education in Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. They offer in many different languages, in Russian, Arabic, French. Um, but for Russia, this is one of the obstacles going forward is that uh, new generations, they don't necessarily speak uh, Russian. And because of that, they're not necessarily exposed to the Russian worldview on security in the world. Very interesting. And just to sort of finish this topic, just a couple of follow-ups. One is from uh, Jajira who asks, what do you think motivates Central Asian states to send more of their officers to Chinese military institutions? So is this just um, uh, a response to the supply that is being offered or is it a calculated attempt to decrease their dependence on Russia in the domain? Um, so that's one. And then Marius asks, uh, how large is the scale of training that we're talking about here for military and police officers? So uh, okay. one is motivation, the other one is scale. Okay, great. So the mod motivation is, um, is uh, there are several motivations. The motivation is of course being exposed to the innovate innovations within uh, PLA and within technical tech sector in China. There is not, not, it's not, not even Western academies can offer this level of exposure to um, the use of AI by uh, military, uh, by, the, by the Chinese military. So that's one. So because it's a story of rapid innovation and modernization in China, that is fascinating um, for not only Central Asians, but um, officers from around the world. And again, there are 160 countries that sent their officers for education in, at least according to PLA and DU. Um, and uh, it is, uh, you know, that the just the physical infrastructure of education in NGU PLA is fascinating for students from um, many countries of, in, in the world. That it is really cutting edge. It's uh, it impresses the students. The, the the type of classrooms, the type of uh, stipends and living conditions that are offered. There, you know, this is something that has to be um, taken into consideration as well. Um, 
And then also, I think one of the stories here, one of the takeaways here is that there is the receptivity for different perspectives in Central Asia. There is a receptivity. And I think there is also a receptivity um, to Western ideas about, um, about security. It's just too bad the West is not invading enough Central Asian uh, students. But aside from Chinese and Russian influence, uh, or Russian um, provision of education to and training to Central Asian countries. There are many other smaller um, players involved as well. And they are also welcomed, their perspectives are also welcomed, for instance, India, um, uh, Turkey, um, Iran, um, all, all these countries also admit small numbers, really minuscule numbers of people, of people, of officers from Central Asia. And there is a, you know, there is a demand for that. Um, in terms of the numbers, so here's the thing, um, hundreds and hundreds of officers and maybe you know, thousands of officers are trained um, and have been trained over the past decade, decade and a half. Um, so uh, we need to really triangulate you know, the exact number. Is it, you know, is it 5,000, is it 20,000? So that's a matter of numbers for training. So the short-term kind of operational and tactical level trainings, when it comes to more strategic level, so the education level, I tried hard, I couldn't find numbers. I couldn't, I, um, so I had really good sources that told me about um, the content of education, but really the, uh, I couldn't estimate the exact number. It's probably, I, I think it's in dozens, the exact number of officers trained in uh, PLA and GU. They're not, as right now, those officers are not yet in the leadership positions. Uh, all of the leadership positions in Central Asia are occupied by Russian or Soviet trained um, officials. Um, so it may take, um, I don't know, a few years, a decade to really see who has been trained in um, Chinese academies. Great, thank you. Uh, so let's uh, move on now to a related topic and a question from uh, Larry Markovitz. So nice to have Professor Markovitz join us today. Uh, he asks, I find the domestic demand for China's military security assistance especially interesting since it can impact the nature of political regime development in the region. How does this domestic demand vary within Central Asia? And what are the long-term political implications of extensive Chinese military assistance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. This is a um, great uh, question. These are great questions. So um, there is so the, the Marlene and myself. The way we research provision of public services is that um, our premise is that there is a, it all starts with domestic demand, and the Central Asian countries uh, they're all experienced. So now at this point, including Kyrgyzstan, they're all authoritarian countries uh, that are constantly experiencing. Um, anxiety about uh, who may be challenging them domestically. So, and the availability of both Russian and Chinese services in training uh, police forces, armed forces, and providing surveillance, it all caters to those domestic needs of uh, expanding um, the uh, coercive apparatus of the state and professionalizing and making it more professional. So that's that. Um, and of course it is, uh, it, it, um, it uh, strengthens the uh, coercive apparatus, it, 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 it does exactly that. And uh, there has been a serious, so during the pandemic, there has been a series of um, militarized um, trainings of police in response to public, uh, public um, protests in all the countries, maybe except for Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan, I haven't followed this closely, but all four countries that has, and they, these trainings, they are specifically using militarized police against the regular uh, civilian population. So it's, a, it's, a, it's in a way the state is signaling that this is, this is how we will respond if you protest against um, shortages of water, um, of uh, unemployment and so on because of the, the public frustration with the pandemic is of course um, expanding. Um, and uh, for how do these interests vary? So for Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, it is because uh, they don't have as much access to CSTO documents that probably don't want to. And that's how uh, China becomes this, this next best opportunity for uh, those two countries. Uh, for um, for uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, the emphasis, the emphasis is really uh, the type of um, material support that comes to the security uh, apparatus um, and uh, 
just the, it, it's really important for capacity building, just the, capa the sheer capacity building of uh, security apparatus. Um, so police training, so cooperation with the Chinese people's, um, um, the Chinese people's armed police um, is accompanied by donations of um, police equipment. Um, so those con connections are both service oriented and also material. Um, and then, um, and then of course, I think, I think the long-term implications are sort of, they're evident, um, just like with Russia. When Russian uh, economic influence declined or the investment into, let's say, the, with the Soviet, the collapse of the Soviet regime, the influence on the construction of infrastructure, the kind of the, the provision again of public goods, it declined. But the uh, the socialization into or you know normative understanding of um, the re regional security um, and opportunities of cooperation they continued and I think those the the softer aspects of cooperation uh, with China or the um, um, the less tangible aspects of cooperation with China China I think they're they're more lasting uh, even uh, well, uh, compared to investments. Specific investments. Interesting. So, on the question of investments, uh, Iskanderbek uh, asks, uh, "What are the priorities for China when dealing with Central Asia? How does it uh, differ uh, to Africa?" So, an interesting sort of uh, comparative question: and What kinds of investments uh, can we expect in the next decade or so? Right. Um, so I want to reiterate that I am an expert on Central Asia. I'm not an expert on Chinese foreign policy. And um, but from what I know from the discussions uh, about China's interest in Central Asia, it'll, of course, in addition to um, uh, sort of, you know, to, pres to become this rising um, leader in the world, it's also the, uh, the Western Chinese uh, question, the Uyghur question, uh, that uh, China is uh, ensuring that it has partners, partnership uh, relations with its uh, Western um, countries that are also Turkic and uh, in that way uh, deters, uh, you know, uh, kind of protest against uh, suppression of um, Turkic minorities on its territory. Okay. Um, and then uh, Vincent asks, is there a connection between military and Chinese aid policy? Um, you know, have you seen those are a lot of, and I guess the implication would be uh, between some of these BRI vectors or official state support for BRI contractors and then the kind of service provision that you're seeing. Yeah, so uh, the PMC is the public, uh, sorry, private um, security companies. They, of course, accompany expansion of Chinese investment in, in, in Central Asia. I mean, you know, one might argue was the uh, speculated ba military base in Tajikistan. That's also an extension of, um, uh, of BRI influence in, in Tajikistan. When it comes to services specifically, when it comes to military education, bilateral military trainings, uh, well, bilateral contacts between um, police forces, um, they are tightly connected with uh, China's sale or donation of its military and police equipment. Um, and uh, the first, first we saw the transfer and um, uh, relations developing in more hardware aspects that uh, starting from mid 2010s, the Ch China started selling more of its uh, um, mil military equipment to Kazakhstan specifically uh, and donating some to um, Kyrgyzstan. But now it is also accompanied with uh, kind of trainings for jointness, for joint operations. So the training, so the trainings and educations, edu education programs are all there to create a similar understanding of what is, secu is a security threat and how do we together respond to it. Yeah, that's super interesting. And it's like the base level um, kind of foundation of this, right? Uh, you know, that joint circle understanding what, what, what these words actually mean um, and are constituted. Um, so you've covered a lot. Uh, I do want to get uh, one or two more in. And I think your Gita has a really timely one, um, which is uh, uh, how uh, the Central Asia and China now feel uh, regarding uh, this just announced withdrawal from Afghanistan. 
are there any specific developments in this field? Will this, for example, um, you know, lead to more surveillance across borders or something like that? China, I know you're not an expert on Chinese foreign policy, but you are an expert on sort of Central Asian regional relations. We've seen this rodeo before and that the Chinese were initially, you know, quite nervous about the 2014 announcement. Yeah. Um, what's, uh, you know, what's, what's your, 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 best, uh, your best read of the situation now? Yeah, there is some nervousness, of course. Um, I think especially in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan uh, about what will happen in Afghanistan. It's undeniable, um, especially with the returning fighters uh, who landed in Afghanistan who uh, were from Uzbekistan or Tajikistan. And then uh, once the uh, Islamic State was disbanded, um, they moved to um, Afghanistan. And there is a close uh, watch whether they're able to mobilize again and find funding and to uh, uh, become a formidable force again. Um, so the Islamic, force, Islamic State in Khorasan. So for, for now, we don't really see that much of mobilization of strength uh, from ISK or ISKKP, so Islamic State of Khorasan province. Um, but there is nervousness, absolutely. It, it, it's there. And it, it does feed into this idea that um, there needs to be the military build up enough to respond to any border intrusions, um, terrorist attacks. And uh, frankly, frankly, so I might sound like a biased um, academic here and uh, kind of propagating my, my own workplace, but uh, really no one, not China and not uh, Russian education offers the same level of understanding and um, expertise into how to respond to irregular threats as opposed to fighting other states. Um, so um, Russia is only doing is only starting incorporating this hybrid warfare. China is also, but that um, because of the 9/11 and uh, events attacks in the United States, this field has really exploded in the Western academia, and that's something Western academia can offer to Central Asian um, officers uh, how to how to under, understand the root causes. So that's what, another aspect of the Chinese and Russian academia that don't really. It's, there is not much of examination of the root causes. Uh, it's more about oriented towards how would you re respond uh, and mostly militarily, not the sort of whole of government approach that we um, advocate for here. Um, so understanding the root cause, and this is where Western academia can really shine. Um, and um, yeah, so, but there, of course, the, back, going back to your question, that there is absolutely, there is nervousness about that. So let's take one more kind of a broader question from Andre in Ukraine who asked, what do you think, uh, how can Central Asia escape influences from China and Russia? Is it possible at all? But very specifically to what you were saying, um, if we are in an era of great power competition, let's posit that. I'm actually sort of skeptical about what that means. But yeah. if we were to adopt that lens, you've made the case that we should not only be thinking in terms of competitive public goods and asset substitution, but also competitive services. What are the implications um, for US or Western policy going forward um, to sort of you know, compete in this sort of service space? Right, I also, so even though this grant uh, by Minerva was funded as part of this near peer competition um, aspect, Marlene and myself, I think we are really careful about not being pulled into this policy domain, but mostly researching uh, kind of the bottom-up processes from more academic perspective. And then, you know, if you have implications, good for G GPR or GPC. If not, well, too bad. Um, but uh, the easiest answer for us is that, of course, the, you know, if, if uh, Western <laughs> security um, communities, you know, the, if, if, if DOD or if NATO countries um, want to make sure that um, countries around Afghanistan don't see situation in Afghanistan and Central Asia, or even in China from the Russian or Chinese perspectives, then there should be more involvement with those countries as well and more opportunities created. So I would say that, so even though the demand, the supply from China outstrips demand, the demand from Central Asia for Western program outstrips supply. 
there is not nearly supply from the Western <laughs> PME community. So the uh, uh, professional military education uh, community uh, to be offered to Central Asia. Hopefully, maybe this will change given the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the kind of US has will have to outsource <laughs> security to, or it's a continuation of security in Afghanistan to Central Asian countries. Um, but uh, because again, again, so I want to also know, mention that the military education be that uh, offering by U US academies or Chinese or Russian, it is about outsourcing your the national security to other parts of the world and dealing with national security that you think are um, you know, concurrent to you by other militaries. So teaching other militaries to fight your, your wars. Um, but yeah, that's one easy, of course, approach to just increase from one or two placements of Central Asian military officers to, let's say, a dozen <laughs> across different PME institutions in, in, in Central Asia. Um, yeah, that's, that's, one of, that's one of the ways to do it. Perfect. Well, you have covered so much ground and you have fielded so many questions. And, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, the the original spirit and purpose of the Allworth Lectures to foster, you know, predominantly Western understanding of, of, of Central Asia, but I think you've also expanded the domain to include China and Russia as opposed to the, as well as sort of the Central Asian regions itself. So it really is, uh, um, you know, very exciting for us and very illuminating uh, that you brought this topic in your cutting edge research. So uh, what's left is to thank you uh, for giving the lecture. Thanks to all of you, wherever in the world you were uh, watching this. Uh, please uh, keep informed of our events and, and follow our other uh, events at the Harriman Institute. And if you join me in a virtual thanks um, um, for Professor Marat, uh, and we look forward to seeing the publications that result uh, from the research as well as uh, your, your new directions. Thank you so much. Alex, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. And again, a lot of the research here and interpretations have been inspired, inspired by your own work in a liberal, both the liberal governance um, and uh, China, Russia, uh, US, Western uh, relations in Eurasia. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.